On September 11th, the Shandong aircraft carrier fleet embarked on an unprecedented military drill, simulating a strike against U.S. aircraft carrier groups. This exercise took place in the Philippine Sea, around 650 kilometers south of Japan's Miyako Island. Such a position not only bolsters the frontline defense, but also blocks potential threats from the U.S. base in Guam. Furthermore, it cements China's control over the Bashi Channel. Asserting dominance over southern Taiwan and the northern Philippines, during the exercise, 13 major warships, along with the aircraft carrier, were deployed. The Shandong was accompanied by two Type 052C and two Type 052D destroyers, as well as a supply vessel mirroring the U.S. carrier group's composition. The remaining vessels simulated the defending forces. The Shandong likely engaged in various mock combat scenarios, including aerial patrols, missile launches, and submarine tracking. Recently, the Chinese rocket force has been severely impacted by an extensive internal purge. According to outside sources, approximately two to three hundred officers have been arrested, significantly compromising the combat capability of the rocket force. Nonetheless, seizing the opportunity presented by the U.S. Reagan aircraft carrier's return to a Japanese port in late August, the CCP decided to deploy the Shandong for an expansive naval and aerial drill. This exercise, simulating an assault on a U.S. aircraft carrier, was aimed at signaling to the international community that, despite challenges within the rocket force, both the Chinese Navy and Air Force remain agile and are in full combat readiness. Surprisingly, the Shandong and other ships require an extensive amount of time to be ready for deployment. The aircraft carrier's engine requires 48 hours of water boiling to initiate. As a result, despite the exercise order being issued at the end of August, the actual drill only kicked off in mid-September. In a real combat scenario, the need to wait nearly 10 days to mobilize is hardly a feasible strategy. On closer examination, there is an evident gap between the CCP and the U.S. military. Both in tactical execution and hardware capabilities, data from the Japanese Defense Ministry highlights this disparity. The Shandong's aircraft managed only 620 sorties in a month, whereas U.S. nuclear-powered carriers can achieve up to 250 sorties daily. Moreover, while the Shandong claims that it can carry between 26 and 32 fighter aircraft, in actual operations, it achieves only about 40 sorties daily at its peak. Additionally, the 20 helicopter sorties underscore its reliance on helicopters for early warning roles, deviating significantly from the benchmarks set by advanced navies. Furthermore, the U.S.'s potential deployment of F-35 jets in the Philippines could compromise the Shandong carrier's fleet's security. In the Taiwan Strait, Taiwan's F-16Vs have a distinct edge over China's J-10s and J-16s. And in northern Taiwan, F-22s and F-35s from Japan's Kadena Air Base could severely challenge China's J-20s, risking a swift PLA Air Force defeat on all fronts. However, domestically, there seems to be little concern. The prevalent sentiment in China is confidence in its anti-ship missiles. The Type 052D and 055 destroyers are both equipped with the Eagle 18 missiles, along with land-based DF-21Ds and DF-26 missiles. The H-6K bombers are armed with the Eagle Strike 12 and the Type 093B submarines with Eagle 18B. Chinese believe it can decisively neutralize U.S. aircraft carriers, thereby challenging U.S. global supremacy. However, real-life battles are far from being this straightforward. In the event of a conflict, the U.S. would likely target China's Beidou navigation system immediately, while China might strive to disrupt the U.S. GPS system. In an environment where both parties have compromised satellite navigation capabilities, the idea that China could precisely strike a constantly moving U.S. aircraft carrier and all its anti-ship missiles seems overly optimistic. Consider this: with a missile accuracy of 30 meters, ensuring a hit on an aircraft carrier would demand at least four missiles to secure a 100% success rate. However, an aircraft carrier isn't static. It can sprint up to 50 kilometers per hour, which translates to about 14 meters per second. Therefore, the CCP would need far more missiles. Imagine that a Chinese anti-ship missile takes a mere 10 seconds from launch to reach its target. Given the carrier's potential speed, it might have moved around 140 meters in that short time frame. Thus, after 10 seconds, the aircraft carrier could be located anywhere within a 280-meter diameter circle. 
Using a missile with a 30 meter precision, one would need an estimated 400 missiles for a confirmed hit. Given the accuracy spectrum of China's anti-ship missiles, which is between 150 to 300 meters, the necessary missile quantity could spiral between 25 to 100 times, meaning a staggering 10,000 to 40,000 missiles might be needed. The capability of China's diverse planes, ships, and missile launch platforms to house such numbers remains questionable. The U.S.'s technological and strategic sophistication might endow it with a considerable advantage in any military engagement. China's vast anti-ship missile development doesn't predominantly target the U.S. Its primary objective is to counter potential U.S. interventions during any naval operations against Taiwan. In such scenarios, the U.S. might not even deploy carriers, but employ alternative methods to deter the PLA from advancing across the Taiwan Strait. A case in point is the Rapid Dragon Weapon System, co-developed by the U.S. Air Force Research Lab and Whitaker Corporation. This modular apparatus can hold four cost-efficient AGM-158 missiles. Released from standard cargo aircraft, these missiles can then be independently launched, achieving saturation strikes. Given that one Chinese anti-ship missile costs between 30 million and 40 million U.S. dollars, the U.S. could feasibly deploy dozens of these missile trays in return. Moreover, these missiles can stealthily cover an impressive 925 kilometers. Supposing a conflict arises in the Taiwan Strait, the U.S. could strategically deploy numerous transport aircraft, launching a volley of missiles against the Chinese naval assembly from a safe distance, posing a considerable threat. It's worth noting that the U.S. had already successfully conducted real-world tests on this weapon in 2021. Furthermore, U.S. aircraft carriers are virtually indestructible. For instance, the decommissioned USS Kitty Hawk endured continuous anti-ship missile assaults for over 20 days, yet remained afloat. It was only after a concentrated effort over 25 days, using large amounts of high-explosive charges placed in critical areas, that the vessel finally succumbed. When we observe U.S. aircraft carriers from a broader perspective, it's clear that they're not just military assets. They're akin to floating cities, home to thousands of American lives. More importantly, these carriers epitomize America's long-standing global leadership. Should one be attacked and sunk, the U.S. would suffer more than just a tangible military loss. It would bear a deep political and symbolic wound. As such, targeting a U.S. aircraft carrier is tantamount to challenging America's very core, and such provocation would likely evoke a formidable response. Even the most audacious of nations would weigh the risks before making a move against such a symbol. Should such a scenario occur, the U.S. could leverage its might to blockade China's vital shipping routes. Although China has an edge in resources like coal and rare earths, it remains deeply dependent on global markets for a myriad of other essentials. A blockade would severely jolt China's economy. Certain hawkish circles within the U.S. might be on the lookout for such an aggressive move from China, as it would offer a pretext to amplify hostilities and pursue even bolder strategies, some that might otherwise be constrained by public sentiment. Yet, some in China downplay the threat of a U.S. blockade. They believe that even if the U.S. were to shut off China's maritime oil routes, they could still secure oil overland from nations like Iran or Russia. Such confidence might overlook the volatile dynamics of resource accessibility and pricing in times of geopolitical strain. In the movie No Man's Land, the protagonist travels on a desert road where gas stations are hundreds of kilometers apart. When he stops to refuel, he is confronted with a peculiar bundled deal. To get gas, he must first pay for an expensive dance show ticket. If he declines the show, he's denied the gas. Should Iran and Russia choose a bundled sales approach, pricing a barrel of oil at $100 but tacking on an additional $10,000 fee, who would ultimately shoulder this burden? For China's wealthy elite, this might be a non-issue, but the everyday citizen could find themselves bearing the brunt of such a tactic. In the broader perspective, state leaders must always prioritize the nation's overarching interests. Should China decide to use military action to address the Taiwan situation, it risks direct confrontation with the U.S. and its allies, while China's trusted allies are scarce. While some might argue that clashing with the U.S. and its allies is a risk worth taking given China's eight-year strategic oil reserve, such a perspective narrowly focuses on economic aspects and overlooks the profound societal, cultural, and human impacts of warfare. 
Some experts posit that given the U.S.'s power, the CCP might prefer a peaceful reunification approach with Taiwan, similar to historical agreements with Tibet and the Beijing peace uprising. Interestingly, the PLA's Eastern Theater Command recently unveiled a live-action animation called Dreams of Fuchun River. This could be a reference to the Yuan Dynasty painting Fuchun Mountain Residence, which in the 1950s became a code phrase for reunification with Taiwan. This animation's release might signal the CCP's renewed interest in engaging with Taiwan. How will this affect Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen? Drawing a parallel, the CCP's armed forces, rigorous drills on confronting U.S. aircraft carriers might seem like meticulous planning without a realistic avenue for execution. It's conceivable that this isn't the bedrock of the CCP's military strategy, but more of a prop to bolster specific political agendas.